Good evening and welcome to the December edition. I guess we're in January, but this is the December edition of the Digging Deep podcast. Very excited tonight that we have Melissa Starnes with us and she is Cody's wife and Colton's mom and she's not a stranger. She's been here before. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're so welcome. It's such a blessing to be here. So glad. And and Melissa led our North Alabama Digging Deep study last night, which was a blessing to me. It always is a blessing to get that extra perspective from other women the night before we actually have the podcast so it was a blessing last night and our study this month has been something that has enriched me i have really needed this because sometimes it's easy to get very discouraged in the society in which we live it's easy for us to um in the face of a society that has changed so rapidly from a society that was basically a morally righteous society. And that doesn't mean that everyone was doing the right thing, but that means that our society frowned on immorality to a society today which applauds, uh, lauds. Uh, the, the word we hear, the catchphrase we hear often is takes pride in blatant sin. And so that it's been, um, this study has been very helpful to me because I realize that no matter what happens in the society in which we live, we are citizens of a better country, Hebrews 11, and it is a country which will not fall from within. It is a country that will endure forever and we are comforted aren't we as sisters in Christ with that reality absolutely we are going to start with prayer tonight and then we'll get right into our study Melissa let us pray dear Lord we just come before you tonight so thankful for the opportunity to study your word and we pray that as we dig deep in your word tonight that we will find lessons that we can apply to our lives and shine as lights as you command us to. We're so thankful for all the work that goes into making this podcast and this study possible. And we're so thankful for all the ladies involved in it and for the blessing of our sisters in Christ and the encouragement and support that we can be to one another. And we know that we would not have that without the, the great sacrifice of your son. And it's just in his most holy name that we pray. Amen. Okay, before we get into the study, just let me say that the very next podcast will be on the last Tuesday night of January. I believe that's the 26th. I need to double check my calendar, but it will be on the last Tuesday night of January. And... At that time, we will be studying, let me just be sure, Elijah, who was persecuted for speaking the truth, but he remained fearless. I looked into that study just a little bit. However, I've I've really been concentrating on the Psalms and David, but um, I am excited for this new study and looking forward to discussing it with you on the 26th, I believe it is, the last Tuesday of the month of January, and Ruth Soley will be uh, co-hosting, and she's a brand new co-host, so we're excited about that. She is uh, one of our newest members, moved here from the island of Samoa, uh, American Samoa, um, via Honolulu. She lived there for a while, and now she's a part of our West Huntsville family, so we're looking forward to sharing a time with her in about four weeks. So, Melissa... You're much younger than I am, (laughs) but I can remember a time when I was a little girl when people went to public school and the Lord's Prayer was a part of every day. Bible reading, Bible stories read by teachers in elementary schools were uh, pretty much common fare in American schools, but I remember a time when I was in high school and by that time I was out of Um, the small Christian school that I attended when I was uh, in elementary school. And in this public high school, I remember going back one fall and the announcement being made that we would no longer 
be hearing the model prayer read over the intercom as had been the custom in this particular high school for decades, maybe even as much as a century. And that was because, of course, the national ruling had finally trickled down to the state of Alabama in which I live. And really, that was, for the time being, the only effect that we saw. We didn't think about the persecution that would eventually follow from that. But then as we progressed just a couple of decades and it was time to enter the new millennium around the year 2000, we began to hear isolated cases pop up in states like California and New York and Colorado, progressive states in which in our schools and in our public places, sometimes those people who would promote or even talk about Christianity would be called on the carpet for that. For instance, uh, in Littleton, Colorado, you remember the shootings that happened around the turn of the millennium there in Columbine High School. And at that time, so many students were killed. And you remember, or you may not, that the uh, local government there allowed parents and family members and friends of those students that were killed to come into that school and hang up tiles on the lockers around that school. And I believe 2,100 tiles that were painted and decorated by family members were hung as memorials to those students who were killed. And I believe uh, something like 96 of those were tiles were actually removed by the government because they contained some reference to scripture or to Jesus Christ. And of course, we were appalled. Those of us who heard about it were appalled that you could memorialize students who gave their lives in that high school and not have any reference to the comfort that Scripture would offer. For instance, tiles were taken down that said, Jesus wept, or Jesus loves you, or the Lord is my shepherd. All of those tiles were removed at that time from that high school. And it wasn't very long until we began hearing things from curriculum around our country. One particular one in Oakland, California, uh, would never have allowed, students never would have been allowed to talk about their faith in Jesus Christ. But they went through a six-week curriculum there in, as seventh graders. Um, I think it was called Across the, Across the Century, I believe, Across the Centuries maybe. And they celebrated the Muslim faith in that curriculum. And they were required to pray to Allah or at least to um, act like they were praying to Allah, to go to the lunchroom and participate in a certain Muslim kind of fast uh, where they were denied certain foods and a prayer grade and a faith grade, a pilgrimage grade. They had to um, go through a, a simulated pilgrimage as Islamic people do. And slowly across our country, more and more and more incidences we would hear of Christianity being squelched, and I'm talking about Christianity in the broad sense of the term, where people who would like to talk about and believe in Jesus Christ were refused platforms in which to speak while people of the Muslim faith or Buddhist faith or even New Agers were allowed those same platforms. And then in Syracuse, New York, I heard about a lawsuit that came out of a kindergarten classroom. A little boy named Antonio Peck was following an assignment the teacher gave to draw a poster for parent night, How to Save the World. And little Tony drew a picture of Jesus Christ with his arms outstretched. And the caption was, The Only Way to Save the World. This teacher did not allow that poster to go up. She said he would have to go home and do another poster. And so he did, and this time he did people picking up trash because he thought environmentalism was what the teacher was wanting. But over on the side, he still had the picture of Jesus or a man who he thought looked like Jesus. 
And the teacher folded that part of his poster back so that that part of his poster, the religious part of his poster, didn't show at all. And it just showed the people picking up trash. And, of course, that went into our court systems, and I believe all the way to the state court, if not the federal court, before that was settled. Then there was a little girl named Morgan Nyman, and she lived in Milwaukee where, again, first graders or kindergartners were bringing their Valentines to class, and they were bringing Britney Spears and NSYNC and all of these different, that was back in the 90s era, mm -hmm. of course, or around the turn of the century. And she brought Valentine's with messages about God, fully rely on God, maybe a little frog, F-R-O-G, fully rely on God. And she was, her teacher took those Valentine's up and said that she couldn't pass those out. And you heard about more and more and more incidences like that until we finally come to this point where in the last year, our Supreme Court, of course, has legalized homosexual marriage. And in our public, publicly funded places, like right here in Huntsville, Alabama, our big spring park was used as sort of the sanctuary, the wedding place for, I think it was 40-something couples on that very first day, mm -hmm. a celebration of of homosexual marriage that took place in a place that we as citizens of Alabama fund through our tax dollars. So we've come to this place where, what else can you think of? Weddings, uh, caterers have to go to court mm -hmm. if they refuse to bake the cake for a homosexual wedding or jewelers have to be afraid if homosexual couples come in and want to buy rings, do we as Christians have a right to not sell, to refuse the sale of that celebratory symbol for a homosexual marriage? Um, we are, we're very close to the point where preachers, and in Kentucky, the, the lady there who worked for the, who was a court clerk who was, or is that what you would call her, a court clerk? Or, or, or circuit clerk? I, it okay. was one of the two, I think. One of those two. And she, you know, just refused to, she said, I, I can't issue the license for a homosexual couple to marry. And so, of course, she was jailed for a time mm -hmm. for that. Very close. We're very close in America to the point where if a preacher reads Romans 8, which speaks about homosexuality as vile affection, the words of the Holy Spirit, that he may be actually prosecuted. We're close to that in mm -hmm. our country for what our country would call hate speech. I say all of that by way of introduction, that as we're talking about persecution by those who are in authority, we as Christians need to study this. Mm -hmm. We need to be prepared because I believe that sort of persecution is really at our doorstep. This is not a political forum, of course, but these, these issues are very biblical, mm -hmm. very scriptural issues. And as I think about them, you know, I, I do have to point out that it's very important for us as Christians to think about the divide in our country between viewing our Constitution as an evolving document, a loose sort of document that changes meaning, changes application as our culture changes, versus viewing it through the original intent. What did it mean when it was written? And, you know, I, I say that to say this. It's very important for us as Christians to understand that this is a living document. It is powerful enough to divide joint and marrow. It is a sword, a two-edged sword, and it is... It is the living Word of God. 
but it's not evolving. Right. It's not a document that changes meaning because the Holy Spirit is the author of this document. And so what the Holy Spirit breathed through those, it is God breathed, and what the Holy Spirit breathed through those inspired men was the meaning. It was what he intended to say to us. And this doesn't change to fit our culture. So it's very important for us to realize that the source of persecution that comes down through our authorities is related to how we view the laws in our land. And we as Christians are going to continue to be true to this document that does not evolve no matter what people may do to the constitution of our land because we understand that these are the words of the living God. So having said all of that now, let's delve into the actual study that we did this month and see how that applies to us as Christians today and how we react to persecution by authorities and how we evangelize even in a culture that is so disturbed by the changing morality which ends up being persecutorial to those of us who are following God's word. Okay, so number one was to read 1 Samuel 17, and that is the famous David and Goliath chapter. And I think the question was, who was the one who was persecuting David as a family member in this chapter? And what did you think about that? Uh, I thought it was um, his brother Eliab. Yeah, it was his brother Eliab. Go ahead and find the passage where Eliab is so critical of David. Now, what has happened in this chapter is that uh, Jesse, dad, has sent mm -hmm. David down to take provisions to his brothers and to the commander. I think it was, what was it, cheese? and bread i think that's right that's all i'm remembering there were three things were three. i've forgotten what they are but anyway it cheese bread and was it wine was it i need to look back it, and it may have see been what wine. that was but in first samuel 17 then david went to see about the brothers and as he went into the camp he overheard some of the soldiers talking about this giant and how afraid they were of Goliath the giant who was challenging the people of God and really taunting them. And so David says, you know, are we, are we, are we really afraid of this giant? Mm -hmm. He says, is there not a cause? And his brother overhears him talking about how that God's people should not be afraid of this giant Goliath. And Eliab's words are found in verse 28. And what, what does he say there? And Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Oh, the gall of this. <laughs> it's really, first of all, he was angry, so he spoke in anger. He may have been yelling at mm -hmm. David. Who do you think you are? And where are those few sheep mm -hmm. that you're supposed to be taking care of? Who's taking care of the sheep, David? And furthermore, then he goes on to say, it's pride that brought you down here, and you might as well just go on back home. That's pretty much the tenor of what Eliab was saying there. So, you know, the holidays are just now over, and there I can guarantee you there's someone listening who had a family disturbance over this holiday season, who had a family member being critical of her because of some right thing she was doing. I can guarantee that because my inbox is pretty much full of, I mean, I hear about this all the time. What am I going to do? Because in my family, righteousness is not exalted. And people make fun of me for doing the right thing in my family or in my husband's family. So here we have David, and it's important for us to look at how David reacted to that mm -hmm. because it helps us to know how to react to that. So 
we notice that David's response was just to go ahead and do God's will. I ask you to find other people in Scripture who were persecuted at the hands of family members. What did you think? What did you get for that? Uh, well, the first one I had was Cain and Abel. Or that's an extreme case. It's obviously the very first one in Scripture, and that was the first one that I had as well. What else? And that's Genesis 4, by the way. And what else did you get? I have uh, Rebecca because she played favorites with her, her children, Jacob and Esau. Okay. And uh, David and Absalom. Okay. Very good. And Saul and Jonathan. All right. Uh, Laban and Jacob. Okay. Uh, Job and his wife. Very good. Uh, Joseph and his brothers. Okay. That's Genesis 37. Saul and Jonathan is 1 Samuel 20. Okay. Um, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And that's Numbers 12 where they said, why did you marry this Cushite woman? And who do you think you are that you're the only one leading God's people? Aren't we just as qualified to lead God's people as you are? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have Hannah and Penia. Okay. And then Jesus and his brothers. Okay. Hannah and Penina would be, probably be 1 Samuel 1-ish mm -hmm. right there. And Jesus and his brothers. And then I had also Mary and Martha because in Luke 10, it was definitely a criticism of Mary's right choice when Martha came in there. Now, maybe she wasn't as angry as Eliab was, but these are some great examples of... It was hard for me because I, I wanted to stick to the persecution um, definition, which is being treated maliciously because of doing the right thing. But in almost all of these cases, that would be true. So there's a lot to be said in the scriptures about family members mistreating one another when one is trying to choose righteousness. And it's important to notice here that David's procedure was to just go ahead and do the right thing. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the, the things that David did here uh, following this incident to go ahead and, and do the right thing. He didn't let this stop him. In fact, he said, is there not a cause? There's a bigger picture here. And we're going to serve the Lord. So do we have comments yet? I don't see any. Okay. All right. Ladies, chime in here. We need you to chime in. Okay. Then we have chapter 18. And by this time, David has, um, we're going to see, he has killed the giant, taken his head to Saul, and he's, he's become popular. He's become praised and popular because he took those five smooth stones. He wouldn't wear the king's armor because he said, I've, I've not tried this and I don't want to go out there with something I don't know anything about. And so he took those five smooth stones and said, I come in the name of the Lord. You know, that's just a key phrase there. I come in the name of the Lord. If we're doing what we're doing by the authority of, which is what by the name of the Lord means, if we're doing what we're doing by the authority of the scriptures, Proceed. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just proceed with an humble attitude as David did and do the right thing no matter who is criticizing us. So David did that, and then it wasn't very long until Saul began to mistreat David in chapter 18. And it says, what is the implied reason for Saul's persecution of David in chapter 18? Give us a scripture and give us the answer to that. What do you think? Uh, I have verse 9. Okay, go ahead and read 8 and 9 there of First Samuel chapter 18. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Okay, so we, we have an instance here where these women, in verse 7, were singing one to another as they played and saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. I don't really think that they were denigrating Saul. Right. I think they were praising them both. Mm -hmm. But it was one of those... Um, well, you know, we say things like that all the time. Look what he's done. He's done this and he's done this. This mm -hmm. is amazing. And but Saul did not like those numbers. Right. 
And so what does this say about the power of a woman's words in the ears of her husband? What's for instance? It's even more powerful than we realize. Oh yeah. You know, it's, we're we're extremely powerful. And what does this say about comparisons? What does this say about um Let's say someone comes into your home to fix something and your husband was unable to fix it, so he said, call the plumber. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell us what, how that might play out. Well, um, to put it into this context, yeah, you might tell your husband what a great job the plumber did and you're so thankful and wasn't he wonderful and I'm going to call him from now on anytime we have a problem. And, you know, how would that make and your look, husband my dish, what, if he, what if he said, my dishwasher's fixed, and man, I wish you knew how to do what the plumber does. Exactly. <laughs> we could save so much money if you just knew how to do this. You know, yeah. we really, really must be careful about the power of our words, criticisms, and praises in the ears of our husbands. We have a lot of power with our, with our evaluations of our husbands. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I was telling you this before, I, I'm going to speak on polishing the pulpit this year. And that's one of the assignments that I have is to talk about the power of a woman's words from this very passage. So I'm naturally thinking about that. So Saul was angry. We, he doesn't have a reason to be angry, but he's angry in verse 8 because those women bragged on David more to a greater extent than they bragged on him. So the women loved David. Saul didn't like that. Read verses 14 through 16 now. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he, had, that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Okay, so here he was wise and Saul didn't like that he was wise. Mm -mm. Israel loved him and Saul was displeased because Israel loved him. The women loved him. He was wise. Israel loved him. And Michal, his own daughter, loved him. Let's read verses 20 and 21. 20 and 20, okay. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore, Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. Yeah, it only pleased him that Michal loved David because he wanted to use that to get rid of David. Mm -hmm. So his heart is becoming really, really wicked um, as a result of this envy. And envy is, we are told, the rottenness of the bones. And we see the cancer really getting to Saul here. And then the, his servants loved. Let's read verse 25, and then let's go ahead and read verse 28. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Okay, this is interesting because as we were talking about last night, Saul said, you don't have to pay a dowry for my daughter. Just go get these foreskins of the Philistines. But he knew that that many Philistines could kill, would kill David. Mm -hmm. He thought they would kill David. Who else tried that later on, putting a man in the battle? So that he'd be killed. David. Yeah, David <laughs> kind of learned this right here, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He learned, oh, if we need to get rid of an enemy or if we need to suppress a secret about sin in our lives, what we'll do is, or we're jealous, we'll, we'll put this man in the battle and he'll be killed. They did the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, Saul here didn't get caught yet. Right. Because David didn't get killed. So... But we see how bad the envy cancer is. Ladies, if you have envy in your heart, pray. Pray about it. Envy is difficult to totally be rid of. Mm -hmm. It's enslaving. And if it's in our hearts, we need to pray that God will help us. Get in the Word 
and pray that God will help us to not let this eat us up because it will eat us up. And let's go ahead now and read verse 28. And Saul knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Okay, so the Lord was with him and he didn't like that the Lord was with him. And there was another one I was going to read that the king's servants loved him. Um, and I, I can't remember what passage. Was, it, was that 20, 20, 23 maybe? 20, oh, it's 20. It's 22. Saul commanded his servants, saying, mm -hmm. Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, be the king's son in law. And it, it says somewhere there, though, that, yeah, Saul's servant spoke these words in the ears of David. So the servants of, of Saul loved David, mm -hmm. and because they were true to David. Mm -hmm. So all of these loves that David had were eating away at Saul and envy was the reason that he mistreated David and what are two ways that he mistreated David from this chapter uh, for one thing he hurled his spear at him yeah and he was playing the harp for him that was a little bit of a of a an attempt to hurt him he was <laughs> yeah. mistreating him a little bit yeah he hurled a spear at him uh, and then he sent him into battle hoping the Philistines yeah. would kill him yeah and so obviously those are two ways that he mistreated him. And there are some more, more subtle ways in this mm -hmm. chapter. But he has it in for David now. And he is the person who is in authority. Then next, it says, read chapters 19 to 22 and list the people that Saul killed or attempted to kill in these passages. It says, is it true that we can sometimes be persecuted because of our alliances with people who are the primary targets of persecution? If, um, if, let's say, in our society, you are being persecuted, let's say the, for instance, and this is just, I'm drawing something out of a hat here, but the lady in Kentucky who had to go to jail because she was uh, refusing to issue the marriage licenses to the homosexual couples. And I, I don't know about her character. I don't know about her um religious background really but I know she made the right decision about that mm -hmm. she couldn't participate in that so there were some people in that city who aligned themselves with her and and many of them were criticized many of them they didn't have to go to jail but they were implicated because simply because they were on her side so are there cases when we can be questioned, implicated. We can be persecuted even verbally because we are on the side of, because we align ourselves with a primary target of persecution. I think this happened in David's case. So first of all, um, obviously Saul attempted to kill David. And you can jot these down and read them later. But he attempted to kill David in 19.1, in 19.10, in 1911, in 19.15, and in 20.31. In all of those passages, he tried over and over and over to harm or kill David. And then in chapter 20, verse 33, he tried to kill Jonathan, mm -hmm. his own son, because Jonathan was aligning himself with David. So we've got David, we've got Jonathan. Who else do we have, Melissa? Uh, Ahimelech. Okay. Um, in chapter 22. Okay. And then Abathar, also in chapter 22. Okay. And all the, the whole city of Nob. The priests and the people of Nob, also in chapter 22, verses 19 and following. So this is a whole whole city of people. This mm -hmm. is a whole bunch of people that Saul has attempted to kill in just these three, these four chapters. He's tried to kill a whole bunch of people. Now, the question is, who in Luke 22 was questioned, was in trouble because he was associated with a primary target? And who would that be? Peter. Yeah, Peter. And who was the primary target? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus was in there being tried. Mm -hmm. Mock trials, uh, no real accusations against him, so they had to make up false accusations. And Peter saw this. Peter saw that Jesus had been arrested. Peter was standing 
where he could still see Jesus. We know that because when the cock crew, Jesus looked at him. Mm -hmm. And Peter when Peter was sorrowful at that point. So we see that they could they could still see eye to eye, but Jesus was Jesus was in there. He was being beaten, he was being mocked, he was being hit, he was being falsely accused. And then somebody at the fire says, oh, you're one of those people who was with Jesus. And Peter was told earlier that he would deny Jesus. And he, he just promised up and down that he would never do that. Mm -hmm. But this was the telling moment. And sometimes the moment when we can confirm or deny is a quick moment. And it came to Peter. Peter was weak. And Peter said, I don't know him. He said, no, I wasn't with him. Then he said, no, I don't know him. And then he cursed and said, I do not know this man. And then the cock crew and Jesus looked at Peter. And Peter, of course, was very sorrowful. I can't, I just can't really imagine how Peter made it through that weekend. I can't either. I'm sure he couldn't eat. I'm sure he couldn't sleep because he had denied the Lord. So the question was, how did he fail when persecuted? Well, that's obvious. But what I want us to think about, and this question wasn't necessarily there in uh, black and white on the page, but how can we, he defected. He basically just defected from the camp of Jesus at that moment. How can we defect? in our lives today. How is it that at the moment, the telling moment, and it might be a quick moment like Peter had, or it might be a more subtle issue in our lives with relationships around us, but how specifically, how can we defect today? And if you're listening, I hope you'll type it in to us. Tell us how it is that when we're around the fire, we can betray or defect that primary target of persecution instead of being supportive of our fellow men who may be suffering for the cause of Christ and Jesus Christ himself who is crucified afresh when we deny him. So how is it today? Specific examples of ways that we can defect when it comes to that crucial moment. Do we have anybody yeah. Well, we have a comment from question two, I think. Okay, let's um, take that and then let's, let's talk about how it is that we can defect and not stand with the Lord at the crucial moment. So what comment do we have? Uh, Nikia says in verse 15, it says that Saul was afraid of him, maybe intimidated, afraid of what he didn't know about David. Okay, very good. Very good. So Saul was envious and afraid. We could, we could, and, and fear... Fear goes with envy many mm -hmm. times. We're mm -hmm. afraid of how the world is going to react to us now that there's this person over here that we view as having more power, more money, more beauty, more popularity, whatever it is. We're afraid of that person. So fear and envy are um, close cousins, I would say. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Melissa, you can start us off. How is it specifically today that we can defect, that we can let Jesus down at the crucial persecution time? Um, well, I think there's a lot of different ways of, you know, for one, we can do exactly what Peter did when we're, when we're put on the spot. You know, we, we might deny it, or sometimes I think we even don't take an opportunity to explain or evangelize about a question that we're asked about the the church or just a comment that's made mm. about the church mm. and why do we do that because we're embarrassed I think sometimes we're embarrassed sometimes it just catches us off guard and we're not prepared mm. you know and, and of course then we carry the guilt of not being prepared mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah I think I think a lot of mm -hmm. times we are embarrassed or we don't know you know what we might get into if we say something. And, and don't you think that we live in this society that is so politically correct mm -hmm. that issuing forth some statement, even a statement of Jesus Christ, a teaching that is directly from the Bible, may evoke 
disagreement in someone around us, it may make someone uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It might be that I'm sitting there on that airplane and someone uh, begins to talk about religion and I have this chance to say, let me tell you about the church of which I'm a member. Is it politically correct for me to say positive things about my religion when you might be a person who is of another faith? Oh, that's so that's so politically incorrect. Right. And so our society wants to wants to put us by the fire with Peter and make us if not saying, well, you believe what you want to believe and and you know we're oh in our world today, there are so many people who claim to be members of the body of Christ who act as if and speak as if we don't believe there's any difference in the church of Jesus Christ and all of the other faiths around us. Mm -hmm. We're standing by that fire and defecting at mm -hmm. that time because answer this. Did that maiden who asked Peter if he was one of Christ's followers, did her soul depend on the blood of Jesus? Oh, absolutely. She had a soul, mm -hmm. an eternal soul. And Peter not only betrayed Jesus, but he betrayed her mm -hmm. at that time because she had an eternal soul. And he didn't address that. He chose to let her go on thinking rather than beginning a conversation. You know, we think about the woman at the well and we think about the centurion and we think about a lot of people who had been distanced from Christ in their previous lives who came to know him and accept him and love him during his lifetime. But mm -hmm. Peter didn't give her that chance really. He didn't even right. talk to her. Well, he was worried that. about her intention of yeah. asking rather yeah. than, yeah. And he was worried about himself. Exactly. Yeah, he was yeah. worried about himself. And so when we think about Peter and the way he defected, right, being embarrassed to talk about Jesus or to talk about his church, to talk about differing New Testament Christianity, the restoration of, of New Testament Christianity is not a popular concept because it's so exclusive. When we talk about obeying the New Testament well, we're automatically um, being exclusive of, of Muslims and of Hindus and of Buddhists. And, and then when we talk about the restored New Testament church, restored in doctrine, re, um, reverencing the pattern that's in the New Testament, then we certainly exclude a lot of people who, who don't have any regard for the authority of the New Testament scriptures who even may wear the name of Christ mm -hmm. in the broad sense of Christendom. So, but we betray Jesus when we're, when we're unwilling to talk about the restored New Testament church and the authority of the New Testament. Other ways that I can think of that we defect, I think we defect sometimes by, that one of course is failing to evangelize, but we can defect by going ahead and being involved in sin. We can defect by failing to keep our children from the world. Mm -hmm. We can defect by failing to put doctrine into our children by using the time that we have as they're growing up and getting into the Word with them and praying with them. We can... We can betray Jesus by, by failing to put him in the hearts of our children. I think we can betray him. Someone said last night, and I thought this was really interesting, we can betray him just um, by procrastinating and failing to do the good that we see. Or fa uh, mm -hmm. one of the people in our study last night is a nurse, single mom. So she... Um, makes a living for herself and her son as a nurse. Wonderful, wonderful Christian woman. But she said, 
I, I needed this job so badly and I took it and they said, I just absolutely will have to work some Sundays. I will, I will have to be away from services. And at the time I took the job, I thought, yeah, but I'm going to send an email after she sees how hard I work, I'm going to send her an email and say, um, I really want to beg of you if there's any way that I can work extra hours on Saturday, if I can work any other days of the week and have the Lord's Day off so that I can worship with the people of God, I want to I want to just petition you for this. And she said, but, you know, it's kind of hard to say something like that. It, it, it's uncomfortable to say that because you don't know what the response is going to be. And so it's really easy for me to think, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I loved her heart for just saying that mm -hmm. because what that meant is that she's looking at Peter and saying, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to be him. And, and so her statement was last night, I'm going home and write that email. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to defect. She doesn't want to, you know, it might be that to put bread on the table, she's going to have to, as she searches for other work, she's going to have to, to continue to do some things that she really doesn't want to do. But she doesn't want to defect and say, it's not important to me to be doing all that I can to be with the people of God. Mm -hmm. She wants to to not be standing by that fire and saying, oh, no, I'm just going to be quiet about this. That's, you know, that's Peter. And we don't want to be there. I don't want to be there. And there's so many ways, I think, in our society today. I think we defect when we criticize the body of Christ in front of unbelievers. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that can happen so easily because, mm -hmm. you know, we have friends who aren't members of the church who... Um, are going to ask us about other members of the church and it's really easy for us to if you know we're not perfect people right and I know some people in the congregation and they know me and they know my faults and it might be easy for them to say oh yeah but I don't you know Cindy Colley is not it's not so great and you know there's a lot of people in our in our church who are hypocritical or you know we can say that in front of people of the world but how does that make Jesus look it not, does not paint a good picture. It doesn't paint a good <clears throat> picture. And so there's a lot of ways we can defect around the fire. Do we have other comments? We do. Okay. Um, the ladies from the Maple Hill congregation are saying not standing up for right or remaining silent when we're in a social group. Yeah. And that's social groups are hard. Mm -hmm. Very uh, good. Genevieve said when we see Christian a Christian being treated badly because of their stand for the truth, and we decide to look the other way instead of standing with them. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, I, I think if those of us who have grown up in the church have, we had to have seen that, especially, um, I can remember times as a teen when I thought, if everybody on these three pews in this youth group would be saying the same thing at school, it would be so much easier for all of us. Mm -hmm. But there would be one or two who would be standing for the right, maybe uh, wearing the modest clothing, maybe refusing to be a part of a cheating group, maybe uh, refusing to take the Lord's name in vain, and maybe saying, you know, on the yearbook staff, we're going to take this out because it curses. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not for this. And, and there would be other Christians, Christians wearing the name of Christ in the room who would say, yeah, but you, you know, this is 19-whatever. This is 2010, and this is the way the world talks. And if Christians would stand with Christians, mm -hmm. then we're standing with Christ. That's how we are around the fire, and we say, I know him. Right. Yeah, we sometimes have to say we know him. Right. Sometimes we do more harm than good just among ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think I've said this before, but once I remember walking <clears throat> home from the bus and inviting a girl to go to a youth event with me, and she says, well, who goes to your church? And I begin to name people. And I shouldn't have named some of those people because I remember she, she specifically said, Jennifer, she goes to church with you? I wouldn't have thought she goes to church anywhere. Oh, and it made me feel so bad because, you know... I, I had a part there 
and uh, putting a bad taste about the body of Christ in that girl's mouth. But Jennifer, she right. defected there. Right. You know, she had defected. And she said, by the way she talks, the way she dresses, and the way she treats people, I would never have thought that she loved the Lord at all. We can defect, mm -hmm. just like Peter did. You know, one thing that's hard about that is, and once we do it, even though we might change, it's hard to ever get that opinion out of somebody's mind mm -hmm. once it's there. Yeah. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and there's a reason. Mm -hmm. why right. We have a couple more okay, comments. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Christina said when someone starts talking about church shopping and you're just not expecting that statement and you miss the opportunity. Right. Oh, yeah. If someone in the community says, I'm looking for a church home, we better be talking. Mm -hmm. We better open our yeah. mouths and say, you know, I would love to tell you more about the church of which I am a member, the Church of Jesus Christ. We right. better be talking about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, Genevieve said, when family members reject God's word and we spend more time and energy pleasing them than pleasing Christ, just to keep peace or so we think. Very good. That's very good. Peter wanted peace at that fire. He didn't want conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Nakia said, by being involved in questionable activities, like going to casinos or sports bars for dinner, we're to abstain from all appearance of evil. That's very good. Very mm -hmm. true. Yeah, and Christina said, sending our kids to participate in ungodly, ungodly activities because it's just what kids their age do. It's a rite of passage, or so, so they say. Very good. All of those are ways that we fail to stand up and say, I know Jesus. And it, it, when we think about any of these, any of these activities, I want us to think about Jesus, the look that Peter got from Jesus. I want us to think about, do I want to look into Jesus' eyes and say, that's just what kids do? Do I want to look into Jesus' eyes and say, um, it, it was really hard, Lord, because nobody else was doing it? Or, or do I want to look into his eyes and say, I know those kids were from you, but I was just so busy, Lord. You know, we can think about all those things and and we really don't want to see the eyes of Jesus as we are making those kinds of provisions for the flesh or excuses about failing to say, I know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anything else there? That's all. Okay, we are going to run out of time. So I want us to, to move on then. And it says, read chapters 23 and 24. How did David respond to those extreme doses of persecution by God's anointed? Give us the short answer there, and we'll move on to the next one, Melissa. Mostly by prayer and uh, just extending grace. Okay, so I loved your grace comment because, well, first of all, in 2310, we see that he responded by prayer. And in 2410... We see that he continued respecting God's anointed one. Uh, in 25.12, we see that as well. 26.12, I believe that is. And in 24.14, we see that he did all this with humility. And, of course, that's under the umbrella of grace. Mm -hmm. he, was an, he was humble. He walked humbly before God. And in 24.17, we see that he returned good for evil. And that is also under that umbrella of grace. He was, he was a man of prayer and a man of grace. And he continued to respond with those, two, with those two characteristics. Now it says read chapter 25. And we're not going to take the time to read it, of course. But it says, what kind of persecution had Abigail endured for years? And what, how does the Bible describe her husband? He was a foolish man. Yeah, I think his name even, even meant folly. His name meant folly, Nabal. And I believe also that um, the Bible re refers to him as the son of Belial in one of the, those verses. He, and that is a son of foolishness. He, he was a foolish man, but he was also angry. He, mm -hmm. he uh, we see wrath in Nabal. And so I believe at the very least she was verbally abused Mm -hmm. And uh, if not physically abused, because he was a man who was selfish and angry and foolish. And she had been married to him for a long time. 
So it says, note the verses that show the following characteristics of this persecuted wife. So what verse did you get for generosity? Verse 18. Verse 18, and that's when she put together the, the, the gifts mm -hmm. that she sent out to David, that she took to David. And then humility, what verses did you get? Uh, 23, 24, and 41. That's what I got for humility. And because she refers to herself as a servant, and then she was a good judge of character. And I got, did you get 25 for that? I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is when she characterized her husband. Mm -hmm. And then she was, she showed respect for God. And what verse did you get for that? Verse 26. That's what I got. Respect for God. Verse 26. She trusted God. I got 28 to 30 for that. Mm -hmm. um, she was a woman of wisdom. What verse did you get for that? I have several. I have verse 3 and 19, 30 through 33, and then 36. Yes, okay. So I had 3 and 36, but there are certainly some others that would fall in that category as well. A woman of wisdom. And then she was a woman of quick resolve. And we see that from verse 34, where we we'll go ahead and read verse 34, if you have it there. One second, and I will. Okay, we're, we're in chapter 25, verse 34. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light that any that pisses against the wall. Okay, so this is David saying there was not going to be a single male alive except for the fact that you did something. You made a judgment and you acted quickly. And I think it's interesting here that we have these chances that are quick chances. Peter failed at the quick chance. Mm -hmm. And here we have a woman who had this opportunity to do something quickly and she hurried up and did the right thing. So it says, how might these characteristics help Christians today who are facing possible harm from those in authority? Um, you know, there's so much we could say about that. <laughs> Obviously, all of these are characteristics that we need to have as people of God. I said this last night in our little study, and I, I want to reiterate this. You know, if, if someone is going to become noted in our society for standing up against the homosexual movement or against sex outside of marriage or against abortion. I don't want it to be a violent fool. Right. I don't want it to be someone who's going to go blow someone up or someone who's going to curse at a homosexual person. I want it to be someone who trusts in God, someone who's generous, someone who's humble, someone who is a good judge of character, who has respect for all the parts of God's word, who I want it to be someone who can articulate and humbly present God's will before our nation. I would like for one of our, I don't want to wish persecution on someone, but I'd certainly rather it be one of our faithful men of God who's articulate, who knows the scriptures, who's humbly standing for God's word, who is first arrested for preaching Romans 1. Mm -hmm. I'd like for that to be the case because we would make Jesus Christ look good before the world mm -hmm. rather than being someone who may be speaking out against what we should speak out against, but speaking erratically, violently, foolishly, without respect for God. And it's very important, ladies, and I've, I've probably said this before too, but it's really important then when we, that when we speak out against sin, we speak out against it because God's against it. Not because I'm a Republican, not because homosexuality is icky, not because we can't speak out against, it's not our judgment to make. 
But we speak out against sin because God, because God's word is, has, because the Holy Spirit has spoken against sin. That's why we speak out. And we as Christians must, must say that with an humble spirit. We, we stand where God stands about sin. Um, I wanted to say to you that, that generosity and humility go a long way in elderships when it's time to do the hard things, when it's time to speak out against sin, when it's time to withdraw, uh, when it's time to discipline, when it's time to correct. If we're serving people who are generous, that we've seen exhibit humble spirits and be kind and gracious like David was, then that goes a long way in um, respecting those men and letting them lead us to do the difficult things. Then it says, finally complete the book of 1 Samuel and then read the Psalms. And there are several Psalms listed there. And then it says, let's talk about, and these are Psalms where David prays for bad things to happen to his enemies. Mm -hmm. And it says, let's uh, talk about whether or not it was right for David to pray for the destruction of his enemies and how prayers for the destruction of our enemies, how does that go with John three sixteen? for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's the quandary before us. Do you have anything you'd like to say about that? Um, I'll, I'll let you go ahead. You say well, it much better. <laughs> well, this is a difficulty. I mean, this yes. is something that's difficult for us to understand when we first look at it. And as I was looking at this, there I, I did some research into this a little bit, and I found that there are um, several views about why David would pray for the destruction of his enemies. And I know we have to stop, but I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about these views. One is that... Oh, but that was in the Old Testament. And so in the, in the Old Testament, there was a lower standard of ethics. God didn't care if we mistreated our enemies in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he gave us this higher standard of ethics. That's one view, that David just wasn't held to as high a standard of ethics. Well, is that valid? That, that can't be the case because the same Holy Spirit authored the Old Testament, as authored the New Testament. Right. It's not David. It's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's the same author. So it's not a, a sub-ethical standard that existed in the Old Testament. We can't, we can't go there. So the next view says that, well, David wasn't praying really for this, these bad things to happen to his enemies. He was just prophesying what would happen to the enemies of God. It was the um, indicative mood there. It was, it, was the, it was David saying all these bad things will happen because these people are the enemies of God. I want you to just listen to these words. These are taken from Psalm 69. Listen to this. Let their table before them become a snare. And when they are in peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they can't see and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out your indignation on them and let the fierceness of your anger overtake them. Let their habitation be desolate. Let nobody dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom you've smitten and they tell the sorrow of those whom you've wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and don't let them come into, into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of your book of life and not be written with the righteous. That's a plea. Mm -hmm. That is not a prophecy. That is David begging God to avenge his God's enemies. So we can't really say that that David is just saying this is what happens to the enemies of God. That's not true. He's pleading there. So still there's another group of people who would advocate that the Psalms are an accurate record of what the psalmists were feeling, 
but God didn't give a, an approval of that. What the psalmists were feeling wasn't pleasing to God. David said these things, but it didn't please God. That's basically the third view of this. That's not true either. Because Jesus Christ himself, turn over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 and verse 43, if you have your Bible. Matthew 22 and verse 43. Go ahead and read that for us. He said unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying... This is Jesus talking. And he says that David was talking in the Holy Spirit. So he attributes, and that was Psalm. I think Psalm 110 was what that was taken from. And, and so when he said that, Jesus said David was talking. He was revealing the words of the Holy Spirit. That's the way I want to say that. David was revealing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was talking through David. So we can't say, I, I mean, you know, some people say, oh, yeah, but there's lots of statements in the Bible, you know, that God didn't approve of. There's words of Pilate, like, you know, um, I'm going to wash my hands of this man, mm -hmm. take him and crucify him, or the words of uh, Judas mm -hmm. when he betrayed the Lord that there's all kinds of words in the Bible that God doesn't approve of. Yeah, but there's nowhere in the Bible that says Judas was speaking the words of the Holy Spirit. There's nowhere in the Bible that says Pilate was speaking the words of the Holy Spirit. So, but Jesus said here, the Psalms are the words of the Holy Spirit. So none of those three theories are working for us. Mm -hmm. None of those three things that I've said are working for us. But I want to suggest to you that... The very fact that it was the Holy Spirit who was talking here is what made it okay for David to say this. It was the Holy Spirit who was saying, Lord, let your, enemy, let your enemies be destroyed. Let those who are trying to destroy me, let their table be bare. Let, them, let their loins continually shake. Pour out your indignation on them. David was speaking through the Spirit. So... He had every sanction of the Lord to say, Lord, let my enemies be destroyed. Because David is recognizing here, David was the anointed of God. Mm -hmm. God had decided that David was going to have the throne. And anybody who was trying to take that throne from him, who was trying to... Um, subvert the plan of God was God's enemy, not just David's enemy. It was God's enemy. And so the Holy Spirit has David crying out here, destroy those enemies of your plan. Now the question is, is it okay for us to pray for the destruction of those who are bent on destroying God's plan? Well, there's a difference. We're not praying in the Holy Spirit. And so we don't specifically pick out people and say, Lord, destroy John Doe. Or Lord, pour out your indignation on this person. We, we're not the Holy Spirit. We're not speaking for the Holy Spirit. But I, I would submit that it is right for us to pray for the defeat of the enemies of God in their plans to subvert God's plan in their works to try to undermine the plan of God, defeat them. I think it's okay for us to, to pray that those who are in positions of authority who want to persecute Christians today will be defeated in that will to persecute Christians because that is the will of God. And when we look at those psalms it is important that we remember that loving our enemies would be wanting what is best for them wanting the eternal salvation of their souls it would be wanting them to know the gospel it would be willing to take them the gospel being willing to take them the gospel being courageous enough to take them the gospel it would be doing good to them feeding them clothing them romans chapter 12 
But when we think about the way that we treat our enemies, we also remember passages like 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9, where it says there that justice is going to be served by God at the revelation of our Lord Jesus from heaven with the angels of his power in flaming fire, rendering vengeance, the vengeance of God. Romans 12 says vengeance is his. Rendering vengeance to them who know not God and to those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Sometimes I think it's really easy for us to say that we don't want to pray for the destruction of the enemies of God. Sometimes it might be easy for us to avoid praying for the destruction of God's enemies because we know that we ourselves are not fully aligned with God. And we want grace. It's important for us to remember as God's children, we're not perfect people. We are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that does fully align us with God. We are not enemies of God. But those people who persist in trying to destroy God's system of religion, his system of morality, who are bent on destroying the effect of this book in our society, we want to pray for their defeat as they make those attempts. Really quickly, Melissa, our last question was um, reading Psalm 37 and making a list of recommendations from that chapter that are helpful to us as we guard our hearts from discouragement as we face persecution. I love Psalm 37, and several of you have written to me and said that was so powerful in my life right now. Some of you who are going through hard things. Some of you who are going through sin in the camp, even within your own home. Some of you who are facing, who are going to be going to court in the next few days um, to, to, um, in some grievous struggles. I, I've heard from, from several of you who are really facing some difficult days ahead. And you said Psalm 37 was very powerful. So what is it, Melissa? And where, where are those um, passages in Psalm 37 that teach us those lessons? Oh, we have to, the first one I got was to fret not. Don't worry. Okay. I have verse one for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, don't be envious of evildoers. Okay. Don't be, don't be envious of sinners. I verse one for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. To always trust in the Lord. Okay. That's three and five. Trust God. To do good. All right. Verse three. To delight yourself in the Lord. That's verse four. Commit your way unto the Lord. That's verse 5. To rest in the Lord. Okay, that's verse 7. To wait patiently for Him. Okay, that's 7. Uh, to refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Stop being angry and vengeful. That's verse 8. And to remember that the wicked will be punished. Okay, and that's another way to say that is just remember your big purpose. There's an end to this life and God's going to take care of it. And that's verse 11. Mm -hmm. Uh, to remember that those who love God will inherit the land. Okay, that's, um, okay. Many got, verses. Yeah, I got that one. And another way that I said that was to show mercy in verse mm -hmm. 21. That's so showing mercy to those around you, verse 21, okay. Mm -hmm. And that the Lord will always take care of the righteous. Okay, and I put there, look to the example of other righteous people that God has taken care of. Verse 37, mm -hmm. God's taking care of the righteous people, and he always has. And so if we do these things from Psalm 37, it will help our hearts to take courage to do as uh, God instructed Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Because even if we suffer to the death, in this land which seems to be forsaking God, we're still going to be victorious. We are the winners because Christ has already conquered the devil when he rose up from that grave and he has prepared a place for us. And if we remain faithful to him, we have already won this battle. I love that. Before we go, I do want to say, I'm going to give uh, her a chance to look for if we have other comments, but I do want to say also that um, much of what I said about, about the Psalms, the, um, the Psalms that talk about our enemies and pray for his vengeance to be poured out on our enemies, 
Uh, much of what I said I took from an article by Jason Jackson um, on the website Christian Courier. So if you go to ChristianCourier.com and just search the imprecatory psalms, you will, or psalms that discuss enemies, you will find this article. I loved it. It um, was very helpful to me in understanding how we um, can can put those psalms that pray for the destruction of our enemies up beside John 3.16 and still reconcile that the same Holy Spirit wrote both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And God can so love the world that he gives his only begotten son and still promise vengeance upon those who persist as enemies of his plan and his will for mankind to be saved. Very good. Do we have other comments before we go? We have a couple. Okay. Uh, the Maple Hill ladies, um, back to our earlier, I think it was number six. They said that we can see that Christ prayed, thy will be done on earth. So we should be able to pray that those who speak not peace be hindered. Very good. Mm -hmm. And Nikki has said uh, from verse, uh, question seven that she also loved verse three to feed on his faithfulness. Feed on God's faithfulness. You know, uh, you have never seen his seed, uh, the righteous forsaken, or his seed begging bread. Our God is faithful. Now, sometimes we might be like the people of Israel and not like the manna he gives us. Sometimes, you know, as Jesus put it, can you be baptized with the baptism wherewith I am baptized? He meant suffering. He was talking about his apostles were going to suffer persecution because they were aligned with him. Sometimes we might not like the faithfulness that we feed on, but God is faithful. He will take care. He will, you know, he will never, the Hebrews writer said, never, never, never leave or forsake us. And what great comfort we should take in that in the year, this new year, 2016, as we look at a country who, which is moving quickly away from the precepts of his word and taking its citizenry into vulnerable territory where it looks like our country may not survive because we're forsaking truth. And we're making ourselves vulnerable, not just in the eyes of other countries in the world, but most of all, we are falling from within. And as we consider, as we embark on a year that is filled with those kinds of fears, let's take heart. Let's read Psalm 37. If we need to, let's read it every day this year. And let's realize that we can feed on the faithfulness of God have any other comment before we finish no, that's all right let's go to God in prayer and I will look forward to being with you again at the end of the month of January may your new year be richly blessed as you serve him dear father we are amazed and humbled that we as Christian women can come before your throne help us father to not be prideful ever before you, to know how small we are in your sight, but yet to realize that we as Christian women who are raising children, loving husbands, that we can have a great influence, that we can impact our homes and future generations, our neighborhoods, our families, our in-laws, our associates in whatever paths you may lead us, Father, we can make a difference for you. Not because of any merit that we have, not because of any strength that we have, but because you've promised us that through Christ we can do all things. Help us not to sell you short. Help us not to be weak and wavering and unbelieving, but help us to trust you, Father, and help us to remember that David started out as just a shepherd boy, but that you had a plan. And help us to realize that you can work 
through us providentially and when we stand for your word, help us not to to fail to trust your power in influencing those around us with your word. We really want to pray for our children and our grandchildren, Father. They're so precious to us. And we want to pray, Father, that we can be instruments in putting your truth into their hearts so that they can grow up and be salt and leaven and light for you in a world of darkness. And Father, we do pray for our country. We love the United States of America. And we know that you have privileged us to be a part of a nation that has been so prosperous for these almost 300 years. You have blessed us, Father, and we are so thankful for her. But we know that she is not your Israel today. We know that that she is not the eternal country, the better country, the heavenly country, but that it is your church. And we know that the United States is not the country for which Jesus died, but your kingdom, Father, was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We look at the Old Testament and the the time when David lived, and it was a time of high priests who were imperfect. It was a time of sacrifices that were blemished. It was a time of a temple that was incomplete. But all of these things have been perfected. We're so blessed to live in that era when we have the perfection of your will, the completion of your will. Help us, Father, to realize the debt that we owe. Not that we can ever pay it, but that we can live our lives to your glory. Help us to trust you, Father. Help us to feed on your faithfulness. And we can do this because of the great sacrifice that you gave us. Through Jesus Christ we pray.